everybody. Good morning. How are we doing? Great. My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors. I'm glad you're here. I have two clickers and neither of them work. So, all right. Um, I'm glad you're here. I hope you find this to be a safe place to take whatever the next step you have towards Jesus is. Uh, we're all a little bit nuts around here. We, we are people who are, honestly, we're pretty screwed up. I mean, if you really get down to the core of it, at least I can speak for me. Um, and we all start kind of going through our lives and we, we think we've got everything figured out and we think we, that we don't really need God and we think that we understand life. And so we just get busy. And then one day, all of a sudden, we kind of realize things aren't going the way I thought they would. I may not be as good at this God thing as I thought I was. I'm worrying about everything. I'm freaking out about everything. I'm trying to control everybody and everything. I'm anxious all the time. I I can't keep living like this. For many of us, we find that moment in our lives, it's sort of that Popeye moment, where that's all I can stand and I can't stand anymore. And we start looking for answers. And we come into a place like this because other people have said, hey, I've got an answer. And honestly, as much as we can't stand that, to be honest, they have something we don't have. They do seem to have a peace about them. They do seem to have a purpose to their life. They're not cycling up and down with every event that happens. Yeah, things happen in their lives, and it's not great stuff, but, but, but they seem to have a peace about it. And that peace is something I knew for me I desperately wanted. So we come here because we want to learn more about this God that everybody's talking about. We want to learn more about Jesus. And we think that if we learn more with our head, that we'll figure it out. That we can add this to everything else we're doing. And then the weirdest thing happens. As we're learning about Jesus, as we're studying about this man that lived 2,000 years ago, we find ourselves falling in love. And we find ourselves in a relationship. We started out trying to learn. Now we realize, oh my gosh, there's a real God and I think he's talking to me. I think he's guiding me. I think he's prompting me. And we don't know what to do about it, so we keep coming back because it's the most incredible thing, to be honest. And so we come back and each week we just keep coming back and we think that if we come back and learn more, we'll get closer to God. But what we discover, this is the crazy part, the more we surrender, the more we give up that old self that we had, the more we see and experience God in our lives. That's why we come here. We're all screwed up. We're all on a mission. We're all on a message. We're all trying to figure out how to get closer to this God. Some of us have been on this journey for a really long time. Others of us have not. And so I'm glad you're here. However you've decided, whatever brought you here, somebody may have promised you lunch and they brought you here and just stuck you here. Doesn't matter, I'm glad you're here. We have a series and we're looking at this, this sort of thing that God, through a man named Paul, told a bunch of people in this place called Galatia years ago. And basically what he said was, he said, look, there's going to be people that come and they're going to claim to be representatives of God. They're going to claim to speak truth. And you've got to be able to tell one from the next. You've got to be able to tell who's authentic and who's not. And he said, here's how you're going to know. You see, I'm going to put my spirit in people. And when my spirit is there, here's what you're going to see. You're going to see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, forbearance, self-control, and gentleness. You're going to see those things. And here's the weird thing. You're going to know it's not coming from them. They experience a love. They express a love that's coming from another place. Paul said it this way to the Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. In other words, we've killed that old self and its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, we should keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, the more that we surrender our purpose, our plan, our arrogance, our pride to Jesus, the more he changes us from the inside out. Now, looking at the promise in Galatians 5, I want you to see something. And this is a truth that I think we just have to wrestle with. If your life is lacking, 
love, joy, peace, patience. Can I, can I just tell you with love, if you're a Christ follower, it's your fault. You've not prioritized your time with Jesus. It's simple. If you find yourself at a moment in your life when you're just not really full of love and joy and peace with other people, don't blame Jesus, blame yourself. Because if you had, these fruits are promised from God. He doesn't say, hey, maybe if you spend time with me, I might give you something. He said, no, no. If you spend time with me, you will have these things in your life. And if you have these things in your life, that means you've spent time with me. He said it this way. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. In other words, you can't grow this kind of fruit on your own. This fruit comes straight from God. Do you see the word in this passage, whoever? Notice that it doesn't say some of you will grow fruit. It doesn't say whoever uh, abides in me will bear fruit. This is a stronger promise. He says whoever abides in me will bear much fruit. Not just a little bit. Not just I'm wondering. So if you aren't producing, you're not abiding. Just say it. Repeat that. If you're not producing... If the fruit of God, if the fruit of the Spirit is not flowing through your lives, not for you to hold on to, but to pour out to other people, you need to go back and spend more time with Jesus on your own. And let me just add something here, since I'm on a roll. Abiding with Jesus includes the concept that you're dependent upon Him, not the other way around. Some people say, I abide with Jesus because every day I tell Him what to do. That's abiding, right? Remember that the vine is dependent upon the branch. Jesus says, look, you're the branch, I'm the vine. I'm the source of life. Our attitude when we come into the presence of Jesus has got to be surrender. A lot of us think we abide with Jesus, but our time with him is essentially us telling him what he should be doing. Abiding brings the concept of understanding what God is doing. God, I don't understand what's happening in my life. I'm going to sit here until I can align my desires with yours. You see, because if I don't understand what's going on in my life, if I don't have a peace about what's happening, if I'm freaking out, the problem's me, not you, God. And surrendering our plans and our thoughts and our desires to his is the key to discovering his peace. I'm going to stay here in this quiet place until I can surrender all my expectations, until I can surrender all of my hurt, all of my disappointment, and I can trust that God will show me what I'm to know. It's called quiet time. I always talk about spending quiet time with God. Can I just remind you? I have to remind myself, quiet times mean my mouth is shut. Quiet time means I'm listening, not directing. So the first few weeks of this series, we're using psalms, basically worship lyrics written in the Bible years ago to remind us of who God is. Looking through a photo album, if you will, reminders of God to remind us of our first love and why we fell in love in the first place. You see, once we reconnect to Jesus, spending time in the sanctuary is no longer negotiable. It's necessary. The goal of this series, remember, is that I could convince you, let me rephrase that, that the Holy Spirit could work through me to convince you to stop believing that anything on earth will bring you greater pleasure than an intimate relationship with Jesus. It's it. It's that simple. Our goal is to prioritize that relationship above everything else in our lives. That we can get to a point in our lives where we say, look, because I know God... I have no other desires. I'm good. Uh, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I've got everything I need. In week one, I talked about how we need to get God's perspective. If you remember that, I said the problem is our perspective is limited and flawed, 
And when our lives aren't going well and we're freaking out, it's because we're using our glasses and not God's. And that going to the quiet place allows us to understand what God is doing and to surrender our will, our plan, our desires, our pride, our directives to whatever God wants to do in and through our lives. We looked at uh, Asaph's uh, Psalm 7 and how he struggled because he knew God was good, but from his perspective, God didn't seem good. It seemed like the people that were not obeying God were being blessed, and the people that were obeying God were being punished. His limited view, he had a limited understanding of what God was doing. And then we saw in that week and in that psalm how his perspective totally changed. When he made the choice to go into the sanctuary with God, He went into the sanctuary. We talked about this, how he took his expectations. He took his desires. He took what he thought he would do if he was God. And when he went into the quiet room, he tore all those pages up and left them on the floor. And he walked out, surrendered to what God's doing. He left his perspective behind and he embraced God's view. And basically he said, you know what? They can have all that stuff. You go ahead, you bless them, give them whatever they want. If they don't follow you, just pour out blessings on them because I have the most valuable thing. I have you. And remember that week we said, are you going to choose to get better or bitter? And that's your choice, right? So one of the things we do when we go to God is we want to get God's perspective on life. So so one of the things we we have to do is begin to understand our relationship with God and how valuable that really is. You see, the value of something increases as soon as you develop this desire for it. The second week, I talked about perspective. We had to gain God's perspective in life. But suppose I told you that when you leave today, you're all going to get a free iPhone. It's an Oprah thing. It works, right? No. You're going to get a free iPhone. Uh, It's an iPhone 8. There's a lot of them laying around. That's good, right? But, But you think, well, okay, an iPhone 8 is nice. Thank you. Paperweight. It's an old phone. But it may have some value if I sell it right, so you're kind of okay with it. But what if I told you that when you leave here, you're going to get an iPhone Supreme Rose Stuart Hills currently valued at $48 million. Now, if you really want it, you better get a really good protective case for it. Just saying. We have a picture of that phone. Is that up here somewhere? Let me see. I want to show it to you because it's got, uh, I mean, if a phone is worth $48.5 million, it'd be nice. uh, Well, we'll come back to it. Okay. Here's my point. When the value of something increases, your desire for it increases, doesn't it? The more valuable something is, the more you want something. The more value you place in spending time with Jesus, the more you're going to spend time with Jesus. Is that simple? If you say you value your relationship with Jesus, it should be reflected in your priorities. It's not something we conjure up. It's not that we decide to love him more. So I want to pause here for a minute, and I'm going to ask you just to pray for a couple minutes. And here's what I want you to pray. I want you to ask him to reveal to you just how big he really is today that he will show you who he is. Because when you begin to understand who he is, his power, his authority, his, his holiness, then you begin to value the fact that he cares about you and that he wants a relationship with you. So for just the next minute, all by yourself, I just want you to pray and ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to begin to reveal to you the power and majesty of God.
Let me tell you something. Every time I turn on the TV, every time I see social media, or I watch the news, I find myself within a few minutes wanting to yell at Tammy, not yell at Tammy, yell out to Tammy, honey, they've shrunk my God. They've shrunk my God. They're trying to fit him in a little box. They're trying to redefine him. They're trying to make him something he's not. Every time I turn on the TV, I just want to scream. You see, our world is constantly trying to shrink God, to make him fit into a box. And yet in Psalm 8, we're going to see just how big God really is. Once we understand who we're talking to, it changes everything about our relationship with him. Psalm 8, written by David, of David and Goliath fame, King David. The psalm contains one of the greatest questions to God in the Bible. In this psalm, David reflects on how big God is and how small he is. And he thinks about his own insignificance. David is sort of rephrasing what we realized in week one. I have no business being in a relationship with God. Why would the God of the universe care about me? He's holy, he's pure, he's perfect. On my best day, I'm dirty, sinful, and fallen. And he asked this question, who am I that you're mindful of me? God, why? I mean, you're so incredible, so massive, so large. And many have pondered what Dave is asking. Some seeking answers from God, knowing that they don't know what they don't know. Others trying to answer questions for themselves. You see, a lot of people think they already know everything. And so they think they already have it all figured out. Carl Sagan was a pantheist agnostic. Agnostic means they don't believe we have the capacity to know if God exists or not. Carl, like all of us, struggled with our significance. Look at his quote. As long as there have been humans... We have searched for our place in the cosmos. Where are we? Who are we? We find that we live in an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. He's a pantheist. That means that he worships creation. He worships trees and rocks and flowers. Those left to worship science, always use words like insignificant, humdrum, lost, unimportant, tucked away, forgotten. Sadly, that's the best answer you can come to if you remove the possibility of God. If you take away the possibility of God, the only thing you're left with is nothing makes sense. Nothing is significant. The only thing that matters is right now, and honestly, that doesn't really matter. I think the saddest thing to watch are people who are disconnected from God trying to discover if they have any significance at all. I watch agnostics and atheists search the world looking for validation and significance, trying to find it in human achievement, in human thought, and it's pathetic to watch. They all end up so empty, so disillusioned, and so lost. If you remove the possibility of God, every time that view leaves you hopeless and helpless. Or as Sagan had to conclude, we're all like drifting sand on the shores of a cosmic ocean with no significance at all. I mean, can you imagine living your life thinking that you have you and everybody you love have absolutely no significance? You're just some random part of some random event that happens to be here. Fortunately, David wrote long before Sagan was alive in a psalm. And rather than imprisoned by our limited perspective, 
were liberated by God's view. In fact, David knew a truth that Carl Sagan sadly missed and so many have never found. Please don't miss this. It's critical. The glory of mankind can only be appreciated in light of the glory of God. The glory of mankind can only be appreciated in the light of the glory of God. It is in that moment when you realize the glory of God, you realize how incredible God is that you find your significance. Because your significance comes in Christ. In that moment when we recognize the glory of God, that's where we find our significance. That's why people who discount or disavow God have such a hard time validating who they are, why they're here, and what their purpose is. So they fill up books and books and books of find yourself, I'm okay, you're okay, fix me, fix this, because they're trying to find out a purpose in their life. It is only in that moment where you begin to see God that you begin to understand yourself. It's not surprising you're being reconnected with your creator. If you want to understand why you're here and what your purpose is, ask the one who created you. It's only in that moment when you bow in worship that you recognize his glory. You realize his majesty. You find yourself in the presence of holiness, perfection, and wonder. And only in that moment do you find your significance and why you're here. There's nothing on earth, nothing ever created, nothing you can create, nothing you can obtain that will bring you more pleasure than an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. People search the world and miss God. So David starts out his psalm, Lord, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. David starts out by praising God for who he is. The heavens and the earth are stamped with the glory of its maker. The power, wisdom, majesty of God staggers human consciousness. We can't even understand it. The things of God are so huge, we speak about the mysteries of our world as if they're an open book to God. The wisdom evidenced in our natural world is just a dim reflection of what he knows. We put all this pride in human knowledge and science and understanding things. And I think God a lot of times going, you have no idea. You're like, you know, you're like a third grader doing arithmetic thinking you've done physics. You have no idea. The amazing power packed into a single atom barely represents of the power of the one who put it there. It'll blow your mind. And he put it there when he spoke it into existence. All the stuff, we look at an atom and we're like, oh my, look at at the power of that. Look at how it does. Look at how it does that. Look at this, look at this. And God's like, I'll make another one. We'll put one over here. His power is so incredible. David praises God for who he is. He's not some small God like the Israeli neighbors worship. He's Yahweh. He's the God, the sole creator of everything. Everything on earth, everything in the universe. And he says, even the universe can't control your glory, can't contain your glory. Think about that just for like the rest of your life. The universe can't contain his glory. He says, look, you've set your glory above the heavens. It's above the heavens because you can't they can't contain it. Everything you created can't hold your glory. David's saying, God, look, you're really big. The universe declares your name. The universe declares your glory. If we want to see your glory, we've got to start with the universe. We've got to look at how big it is, how organized it is, how deep it is, how never-ending it seems to be to us. Think about that for a moment. You want to get an idea of what can't hold God's glory? What's too small to hold His glory? I want you to think about the universe. Think about how big the universe is. It's massive. 
We're one little planet next to a sun, and as soon as you start zooming out, that sun gets really small, and there's a whole bunch of, and then a whole bunch, and then a whole, and, and you just keep going back and back until the entire universe is there, and even that can't contain the glory of God. And then he turns and he says, through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. David, what are you talking about? We just went from big God, big universe. Can't contain him. And now you're talking about little babies? David, get back on track. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. It's very interesting. The the God who created all this, whose glory is so great that even his own creation just is a glimpse of him. He's so majestic, yet he's ordained children and infants to praise him. The word infant here in the original language, you know what it means? Infant. Yeah, uh, a child still breastfeeding. God ordains for praises to come out of their mouths. That's weird to me. I never knew that my children, when they were babbling young, praising Jesus. If you have an infant at home and they're screaming, you might want to celebrate. God says, you you know what I've ordained? Do you know what I've done? Yeah, I've created the universe. Yes, I spoke it into existence. Yes, I'm I'm bigger than all this, but you know what I've ordained? In other words, do you know what I've commanded? Do you know what I've said has to happen and will happen because I'm God? I want infants and children praising me. That's what I'm ordaining as God. Why would God choose for infants to praise him? God always seems to be different, doesn't he? Sort of an odd paradox. Throughout the entire story of Scripture, it's the weak shaming the strong. Yes, I've created an entire universe. I've created a massive universe. It can't hold my glory, but let me tell you something. That little baby knows it. Do you remember when Jesus quoted this verse? Palm Sunday, riding into town on a donkey. People are shouting, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. Do you remember that moment? Matthew 5, 6. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. They said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said, yes, have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? Picture this, children in the temple. Jesus coming in as Messiah. They recognize it, they're shouting, they're singing, they're dancing, they're doing what children do. They don't know not to do that. They're praising Jesus the way kids do and the educated religious leaders come to Jesus livid. How dare you allow these young children to praise you in the temple of God? Who do you think you are? Only God can be praised here. And Jesus is like, you're starting to get it. You're not believing it, but you're getting it. You see, these children recognize that I'm God because he ordained it, and you don't. Then... Jesus reminds him of David's prophecy. And he's trying to tell these educated adults that are supposed to be experts in the scripture, intellectuals, well-versed. They're supposed to be looking for and recognizing the promised one. They're the ones who are supposed to know it's him. And they totally missed it. And what's happening right here in this moment, David wrote about hundreds of years before. He's telling them, you should be doing what the children are doing. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you've prepared praise? You who claim to be so smart, yet you're unwilling to praise me. So I've ordained these children to do that, and if that stops, the rocks are going to do it. Because I'm bigger than all of creation, I deserve glory and praise. And then the other thing, 
God reveals through David the reason why these children praise God. You could spend the next six months thinking about this one thing. Look at this verse. It's about to blow up right in front of us. The praise of infants is a stronghold. These babies praising Jesus are a weapon used by God to silence enemies, foes, and avengers. Who's the foe and the avenger? Satan. Children and infants praise Jesus, and in doing so, they silence Satan. How does that work? Why did God choose this? Do you see the contrast? Wildly defiant, evil, powerful Satan, poised to kill and steal and destroy, scheming, planning, conniving, deceiving, and the weakest of all, a little child in Jesus' name from a pure heart silences him. You see, our praise defeats the enemy every time we lift it up. The shackles of of Satan's schemes unravel. When we praise God with a childlike wonder, we become totally dependent on him. When we worship, we take ground back that the enemy's stolen from us. Are you struggling with oppression in your life? Do you you feel like you're under spiritual attack all the time? Do you want to silence Satan? Then lift your voice in praises of Jesus. The Scriptures tell us that God inhabits the praises of His people. Satan will not stay in a place where Jesus is being lifted up and praised. He wants to destroy you. But even a baby has power over him if they praise Jesus. Your life is to be given to praise God. Do you know one of the greatest ways we praise God? By choosing what he wants rather than what Satan wants. You see, a lot of times we think praising God is worshiping or singing a song. But we shout praises to God when we say, no, Satan, that's okay. You see, I've got Jesus. I don't need anything else. The most positive statement we can make as believers in spiritual battle is to look at all the world has to offer. Money, fame, power, the praise of other people. To be tempted by Satan with the temporary desires of this world and to say, no, no. I'd rather have Jesus. Satan tried to do this to Jesus, you know. The devil said to him, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus said, no, it's just food. I I got the father. I'm good. Thanks. I don't want that. So Satan says, well, he took him up and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in the moment of time. And he said to him, to you, I will give all the authority and glory for it has been delivered to me and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him alone. Only him shall you serve. That's just Jesus saying, no, no, that's just stuff. I've got the Father. I'm good, thanks. Not interested. We silence Satan with our praise. The praises we lift up by song, the praises we lift up in our lives, we silence Satan when we are tempted by the things of this world and just like Jesus who we are following We say, no, I'm not interested. Those things have no value to me. Those things aren't important to me. There's nothing Satan loves more than to brag about how he tempted us and we fell. But there's nothing that silences him faster when we say, no, I got Jesus, I don't need that. This world has nothing for me You see, I'm following him. And then we get to one of the most famous verses in the Bible. 
When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of him? Human beings that you care for him. I've talked about this before. Have you ever spent a night really staring at the stars? I mean, getting away from it's really staring at the stars. I can remember looking up to the moon, and I've shared this before, a hot summer night in Texas, July 20th, 1969. I remember like it was yesterday. I was eight years old. I remember laying out on this trampoline we had in the backyard. That was back when we were allowed to have those before the insurance companies figured out they hurt people. I was there for hours just staring at the moon. Hours. Neil Armstrong had just made one giant step for man and one giant leap for mankind. I watched it on the black and white TV. He was still up there. I remember how amazing it was to me that there were people spending the night on the moon. But it didn't take long to realize that I'm like really small. The universe is really big. I think David had many nights like that as a shepherd. I think growing up as a shepherd, David spent a lot of nights out under the stars. It's one of the reasons, just on an aside, one of the reasons in Scripture you read so much about the heavens and the stars. Because in the hot areas of the, of the promised land, the Middle East, they slept on the rooftops because it was cooler. So most of them knew the stars. They knew the planets. They knew every, they, 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 every night it was their television. It also gave them an incredible perception of just how big God is. I spent that night on the trampoline for a long time just alone with my thoughts. The universe, all that God has created, it's the work of his fingers. The moon, the stars, he put them in place. He said, you go there, you go there. If that's true, why in the world are you thinking about us? You got this entire universe. We're just talking about one little solar system in one Milky Way and one monstrous galaxy. I mean, why are you thinking about us? What, who are we that we matter? Why do you care about us? That's what spending time alone with Jesus does, by the way. David was often alone with Jesus at night. Considered the heavens, considered the moon, considered the stars. And as he did, he began to gain God's perspective. He began to see just how majestic and huge God is. It's hard to wrap your mind around, isn't it? I mean, when you think about just how big he is, let's just think about the Milky Way, okay? This little thing right here, Milky Way. We're like one little bitty, like you can't even see the sun on there. It's, it's inside of one of those dots that's inside of one of those dots that's inside another dot. And that's the sun, which we think is big. And we're a little planet spinning around that little star over there at about 5 o'clock and out towards the periphery, and, and it's just one star, and that's our entire solar system. You can't even see our sun in that picture. You know how big the Milky Way is? 100,000 light years. Okay. You would have to travel 86,000 miles a second. Think about that for a minute. Boom, boom, 86,000 miles for 100,000 years years just to get across from one end to the other that's a road trip 86,000 miles in one second and you got to do that for a hundred thousand light years can you even conceive how big that is I mean just I don't know expect your heads to be exploding or something it's like 86,000 a second for 100,000 years. Think about how fast you'd fly past Earth. The Earth is only a few thousand miles in diameter. You blow past us in the first millisecond. Do you see all those galaxies? 
Do you know how many galaxies like the Milky Way there are? Now remember, we just went across this one. 100,000 years, 86,000 miles a second. They estimate that in the Milky Way, which is just one of these things, there are 500 billion of them. Let me correct that. 50 billion of them. Got carried away there. 50 billion. 50 billion galaxies are buried in the Milky Way. And we're just one little planet that God called Earth. It's mind blowing. And yet, David says, Look, it's one thing for God to think about us, but look at what he says the Son of Man that you care for him. He not only thinks about us, David says he cares about us. He's involved with us. He cares what happens to us. He's watching over us. The scriptures say he's singing over us. He knows everything happening in our lives. He knows what's going to happen. Everything is arranged for us. He's got it all planned. The God who created all of this had a choice to create you or not. And just like he created all that, one day he turned his attention to you and said, my creation will not be the way I want it until so-and-so hits the earth. And I'm going to watch every second of their life. And I'm going to care for them and watch over them. And I want a relationship with them. On your best day, you don't deserve that. Think about it. Now think about this. What are you going to do in your life to impress that God? A lot of people say, well, I'll work my way into heaven. What are you going to do? You can't speak another Milky Way into, I mean, think about it. Or when I get to heaven, I'll tell God what he, really? You're forgetting, who, see, you shrunk my God. Stop shrinking my God. Because he's powerful and he's majestic and he's holy and he speaks and things like this happen and it can't even control his glory. That's who we're talking about. Stop trying to make God into this personal genie that you can put in a box. He spoke all this into existence and David says it can't contain your glory. So just think about how many millions of billions of miles it would take to actually contain his glory. And the answer is it can't. Now picture this. The glory that created all that. That the universe can't contain. Came to earth as a helpless baby. (laughs) Putting aside all his majesty. His glory to die on a cross. Allowing his creation to murder him. Do you really think you're too big to surrender your plans to him? Do you really think you're too smart or too wise or or too in control to give up control to him? Really? David said, God says, I've set my glory in the heavens. The heavens can't contain me. He's saying, look, if you're fascinated by what I made, you should see me. The God who created all this is just waiting to meet you and me in the sanctuary. And yet we think we're too important, too big. Our schedule's busy. You don't understand. I don't have time to be alone with Jesus today. Really? He says he'll meet you there. He says you can have a relationship with him. If you just stop doing all the stupid stuff you're doing all day and spend time with him, he'll change your life. You'll begin to understand your significance. He wants a relationship with you. And yet we think this earth has something to offer us that he can't. In a different psalm, David said it this way. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No 
sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out to all the earth, the words to the ends of the world. In other words, the stars in the skies, they can't speak, but they're shouting. They're shouting His majesty. And everybody can see it. Because the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. David's saying every day, every night God puts on a show. Every night. He reveals who He really is. There's no speech or language where His voice is not heard. There might be a million languages on earth, but the languages, the, the, the majesty spoken through the universe is evident to everybody. God's knowledge is delivered every day and every night to every person on earth. All you got to do is walk outside and look up and you know there's a God. You know there's a God. He says it's self-evident. Think about 100,000 light years across one galaxy. 100 billion of those galaxies and they can't contain God. And yet you and I Every day, me included, try to fit him into a box. Try to fit him into our schedule. Try to fit him into our time. Try to do life our way with his blessing. Is there really anything, anything on this earth that should be more important to any of us than a relationship with that God. There's nothing on earth that'll bring you more pleasure than an intimate relationship with Jesus. The heavens declare the glory of God, but they can never contain it. God's glory is everywhere. The glory of mankind can only be appreciated in the light of the glory of God. It is in that moment when you recognize God's glory that you begin to understand your significance because you're created in his image. If you never experience the glory of God, you never understand why you were created and whose you were created to be. That's when we find our significance. I want to think about this, but I'll close with this once I find it. We find our significance in the things of God. We spend our lives running around trying to figure out what's happening. And we put things in front of a relationship with Him. I really struggle sometimes personally with this. Because I know all these things. And yet, even though I know these things, I find myself busy doing other things, not prioritizing my time with Jesus, getting to the end of my day and realize that I haven't even really talked to him and I'm a pastor. The heavens declare the glory of God, and from the lips of children come his praises. He placed his glory in the heaven. He puts his glory, his praises on the tongues of children and he puts on a show every night, every moment and I walk around oblivious. Satan tries to shrink our God and steal our significance. Satan flees. Are you sick and tired of everybody trying to shrink your God? When I see TV, when I see people try to shrink my God, I just want to scream. Honey, they're shrinking my God. Natalie's going to lead us in a song. The worship team's going to play. And I want you to sing this song with a new perspective. I want you to sing this song understanding who we're singing to. You know, a lot of times we go through worship songs much like we go through the days of our lives a little busy. But in the next few moments, I want you to stand up and I want you to worship the God who did all that and yet still cares about you and me. Let's pray.